Hi, everybody. So I think all of you have been waiting for the uh, OBG recalls and discussion of yesterday's exam. So it was a very interesting exam. First of all, it was done in two sessions, the morning session and the evening session. So a lot of questions um, and uh, a mixed perception about the exam. Some students are saying it was quite easy. Some were saying it was difficult. But some general consensus points were there. Number one, um, uh, there were a lot of previous year questions, which I will show you. Um, they may not be same repeats, but they're from the same topic. So that emphasizes more and more how it's important to revise the same topics that have come previously. Also, there were very few images from OBG, surprisingly, and very few clinical based questions. So uh, a sort of uh, a mixed response, but overall the difficulty level, at least for OBG, was pretty all right. Now, um, I think you all know, most of you at least do know who I am. Sorry, there's some problem with my pen. Just let me get this working. Yeah, so uh, you all who know who I am. I am Dr. Rena and I uh, have my own uh, Instagram and YouTube channel uh, by the name of OBG Classes by Dr. Rena. And you can find me here. For those of you who have not joined, please subscribe both Insta and YouTube and you'll find lots of lots of interesting stuff and interesting ways to learn the subject. Now, uh, so we'll start with the, I've divided the entire discussion into the morning questions and the evening questions. This becomes easier for those uh, who want to just see the morning recalls, those who attend the morning session and those who want to see the evening recalls. It becomes easier that way. Uh, but also remember, these are just recalls. They're not the actual questions. And although I have tried to be uh, as accurate as possible from different sources, uh, there are obviously mistakes um, whenever they recall. So please, in the comment section, try to add in or rectify whatever can, uh, whatever you think I have been, I have put wrongly. Uh, that would be a big help. Okay, so let's start with the morning session. Question one, which is not a method, which is not a method for first trimester medical termination of pregnancy. Now the options were methotrexate, mifi plus meso, extra amniotic installation of ethacridin lactate and a DNC. And the answer for this was extra amniotic installation of ethacridin lactate. Now this is actually a method of second trimester MTP, although it's an outdated method. When we did our postgrad, when I did my post graduation almost 15 years back, that is when I saw I think I've seen two cases of ethacridin lactate installation. We don't use that anymore now. It's not even available in the market. Okay, so that brings us to quickly. So with each question, I'll just quickly uh, do a bit of revision of that topic. So in the first trimester, we can do, do that is still 12 weeks. We can do both medical plus surgical termination. Uh, medical termination is actually done till nine weeks. Okay, uh, preferably because the success rate is higher. Between 9 to 12, we don't do medical termination. Suction evacuation, that is surgical termination or a dilatation and evacuation can be done till 12 weeks, even go up till 14 weeks. Okay, but beyond 14 weeks, we prefer to do a medical abortion again. Okay, so it's a little confusing, but to make it clearer, till 9 weeks, we can do a medical abortion easily. And then after 14 weeks, again, we use medical. And in medical, what do we use? In both instances, we use MIFI plus MISO. So the only time we don't use or we prefer not to use is between 9 to 14 weeks. Okay, remember a suction evacuation can be done safely till 14 weeks. But beyond that, so this is a suction and evacuation. Beyond that, the fetus becomes very big. So if, it, if at all it is done, it is to be done only by specialist practitioners. So after 14 weeks, we again prefer medical management. Okay, so this is these are the methods of MTP. Of course, the rarer methods are there like ethacridin um, lactate administration. So this is how it's done actually, where uh, in fact, you can give ethacridin lactate, you can also give saline and these are instilled through Foley's catheter extra amniotically. So it separates the amniotic membrane from the underlying residue. This stimulates prostaglandin release and this causes contractions. So this is how a second trimester MTP can also be done. But now we don't use these methods. We prefer mefepristone plus mesoprostol. 
second question which would be defined as primary amenorrhea okay so there's a question when ages were given and the breast tanner tanner stage was given so age 11 tanner stage 1 age 14 tanner stage 1 age 12 tanner stage 4 and age 13 tanner stage 5 these are the options that i got okay so now what first remember what is primary amenorrhea what is the definition so the definition is a girl who is more than 13 years who has not attained menarche and also who has not got secondary sexual characters so, so 13 years in the absence of secondary sexual characters or more than 15 years in the presence of secondary sexual characters is known as primary amenorrhea right so if amongst then amongst these options what do you think would fit the definition best okay and earlier the definition of um, uh, primary amenorrhea was taken as 14 years and 16 years so it has recently been changed to 13 and 15 so a girl who is 14 years and tanner stage 1 tanner stage 1 means she has not yet developed has any development of the breast it's this first stage so age 14 with absent secondary sexual characters who has not attained menarche would be the best answer for this question okay so as i said 13 years earlier 14 without secondary sexual characters 15 years with secondary sexual characters and you have tanner staging 1 2 3 4 and 5 for both the breast <coughs> and the pubic hair Okay, next question, and this is a repeat question. Okay, so remember, this is a repeat. The earlier two questions, the area is the same. Primary amenorrhea, remember, is a very important area. Questions keep coming. Okay, even MTP is a very important area. Questions keep coming. This is a direct repeat question. As per WHO, the minimum number of ANC visits are, and the correct answer is eight. Okay, so the WHO says that eight visits are the minimum number of visits as per the who four is the number as per the ministry of health and family welfare that is our country guidelines the ministry of health and family welfare says four but who says eight and when should these visits be so these visits are called as contacts the who says don't call them visits call them contacts the first contact is up to 12 weeks that is in the first trimester one contact in the second trimester two contacts and in the third trimester five contacts is what the who says so this is eight contacts this is a direct repeat question i think from two or three years earlier this is also a direct repeat question the first sign of magnesium toxicity is and the correct answer is loss of deep tendon reflexes where all do we give magnesium we give magnesium sulfate in obstetrics we give it in several situations we give it in eclampsia we give it as <coughs> prophylaxis in severe preeclampsia so that eclampsia doesn't happen we give it as prophylaxis in severe preeclampsia we can use it as a tocolytic in preterm labor and we can also use it as a neuroprotective agent for the fetus in women who are going into early very early preterm labor so that's why it's important to know <coughs> everything about magnesium sulfur and this is directly i have picked up this paragraph from williams remember lots and lots of questions came directly from williams you find entire again word to word uh, uh, <coughs> verbatim uh, word uh, sentences have been picked up from williams what is williams says so williams says patellar reflexes disappear when the plasma magnesium level reaches 10 mL per liter <coughs> okay and then when it rises above 12 then respiratory paralysis and arrest and what is the antidote the antidote is calcium gluconate and beyond this you have cardiac arrest and death <coughs> sorry excuse me please so this is how um, uh, so this is again directly from williams but this is also a repeat question and a very important question okay next question which amongst the following is wrong regarding plate decelerations number 1 they are smooth and gradual number 2 start after the uterine contraction starts and ends after the uterine contraction ends the fall in heart rate is more than 10 to 20 beats above the baseline and it is not followed by an acceleration okay so i'm not sure about the correct options but uh, i mean what what the options were but i would go with option number c one second the pen disappears okay 
so because the fall in heart rate is below the baseline not above the baseline but i'm not sure again <coughs> of the correct options there may be something else because there was some confusion in the options in this question but again this has been verbatim picked up from williams and what does williams say well this is a late deceleration okay so this is a late deceleration okay the contraction the deceleration starts after the contraction after the peak so that the nadir of the deceleration is after the peak of the contraction okay and once the contraction ends the deceleration picks up so what is and this is seen typically in fetal distress or asphyxia okay so this is a late deceleration now this is exactly picked up word word from williams it is a smooth gradual symmetrical decline in fetal heart begins at the contraction peak and returns to baseline only after the contraction has ended the nadir is within 30 seconds of its onset the typical depth is 10 to 20 beats per minute below the baseline and usually not accompanied by an acceleration okay so i'm just a little confused in the options okay whether it was below given or above given and how exactly was the contraction defined but this is how it is defined it begins at the peak of the contraction okay and returns to baseline only after the contraction has ended okay so this is how you define a late deceleration okay next question which is not a component of the biophysical profile and this is again a repeat question okay so you can see lots and lots of repeats and what is the correct answer the correct answer is a dfmc what are the components of the biophysical profile number one you have the non stress test and then you have four ultrasound parameters amniotic fluid volume fetal tone fetal movement and fetal breathing movement all these four are ultrasound parameters and you have one nst what is modified bpp which came last year need pg modified bpp is nst plus an af i amniotic fluid index okay so this was i think this was an if i'm not put volume given okay then fetal tool and dfmc of course is not a member of the or not a component of the biophysical profile okay so this was a question which stumped a lot of people including me okay i am presuming the options were all as are given here all are causes of uterine dysfunction except okay the options given were chorioamnionitis multiparity high station of fetal head and neuraxial blockage in other words this basically means epidural labor analgesia okay now so i went back and i searched and um, initially i was thinking it would be epidural because that usually doesn't affect uterine contractions okay because multiparity was given not grand multiparity and i went back and i opened williams and this question was actually taken from the new williams this table this is the page number and it clearly says the the title of this table uh, is causes of uterine dysfunction and you can see the question has directly been taken from this um table so chorioamnionitis is a cause neuraxial analgesia so i was reading about epidural it does cause it can affect uterine contractions it can cause prolonged labor it of course affects the sensation but can also affect uterine contractions and of course a higher station of labor onset nulli parity is a risk factor okay but nothing else is mentioned so the correct answer and this knowing the inict paper people this table is directly from williams the correct answer to this question would be multi parity okay so nulli parity causes uterine dysfunction nulli parity uh, sorry nulli parity causes uterine dysfunction multi parity does not is not a cause of uterine dysfunction as per this table from which this question has directly been picked up from okay next question which is the wrong statement again i didn't have one option in this so you guys could help me out here which is the wrong statement related to calculation of the period of gestation so is it is it is calculated from the last day of the lmp and this is probably the wrong statement because it is calculated from the first day of the last menstrual period we always ask the woman the first day not the last day okay then yes first trimester ultrasound is the best assessment for pog this is correct this is the crl measurement and in an ivf pregnancy we always take the date of embryo transfer that's very essential to calculate the pog so from the date of embryo transfer we add 38 weeks or in other words we add 
9 months and subtract 7 days to get the period of to get the estimated date of delivery okay and we always calculate the pog based on the date of embryo transfer so this is the wrong statement of course please help me out and complete the options that would be really helpful again a repeat question des so it was earlier asked in a different way earlier asked it was the cause of which male anomaly in male fetuses but now it's been asked in female fetus. So DES was basically, it's an estrogen. And in the 1970s, it was found to be useful in treating recurrent pregnancy loss and women who had preterm labor. Okay, it was basically to, given to support the pregnancy, like how we give progesterone these days. But later on, it was found that daughters, that is, it is they're actually called DES daughters, Okay, they have were found to have increased incidence of certain things like Mullerian anomalies and also clear cell vaginal carcinoma. These women, these girls were found to have an increased incidence. Okay, in the male fetuses, there was found to be an increased incidence of hypospadias. Okay, so this is again a repeat question. DES daughters, you should know increased incidence of clear cell vaginal carcinoma. Again, help me out here. Let me know what the last option was. Okay, next question. Vulval carcinoma is seen in which age group? Again, a confusion between the options. Okay, so I had some students who said this was the option given. Okay, which sounds a bit off because this is a huge range. Okay. I am not sure of the options, but remember that uh, vulval carcinoma is a disease of the elderly woman. The mean age at which it occurs is around 62 years as per Novax. And it is seen very, uh, if I mean, amongst all the women who have it, 80% occur in after 50 years of age. So postmenopausal is the best answer. It doesn't occur in the young age very very unlikely so i do not know what the options were please check and the correct option is that closest to more than 50 years so if these were the options which some students have vouched by that these were the options i would have actually got with none because it doesn't occur early it occurs after 50 years of age okay so please remember this check the options and let me know again in the comment section what you think the correct option should be in paper B in the evening session, another question came on vulval cancer and vulval cancer has been earlier asked in AIMS 2020. Okay, it had asked treatment in that. So, vulval cancer is sort of an area. It's not a common cancer, but probably uh, for your INICT, it is one cancer which you should not misread, miss reading on. Okay, so these are the risk factors in the evening paper. The risk factors were asked. What are the risk factors? Age, postmenopausal, the white race, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, nulliparity, lesions on the uh, vulva like lichen sclerosis, VIN, Paget's disease, again, human papilloma virus, which also is a risk factor for CA cervix, smoking, which was one of the options in the evening paper, immunodeficiency, and cervical cancer. Okay, so these were the these are the risk factors for vulval cancer, and we'll do this question again in the evening paper. Next question again. This is a repeat question, and one of the favorites. They always ask teratogens, so you should know these. Okay, so match the following: warfarin causes warfarin embryopathy. What is warfarin embryopathy? It is depressed nasal bone with stippling of the epiphysis. What does thalidomide cause? It causes phocomelia. Okay. What does lithium cause? Lithium causes Epstein's anomaly and what does chloramphenicol? It causes grey baby syndrome. So this was sort of straight off easy previous year. Repeat. Next question. The correct sequence for performing a dilatation and curatage. A lot of sequence questions came. I heard in surgery also uh, in other subjects also. So also in this paper and in the evening paper. So what do we do when we do a DNC? We always number one assess the size of the uterus and see if it is antiverted or retroverted by doing a bimanual examination. What do we do next? The next thing we do is we sound the uterus using a uterine sound. Then we dilate the uterus, the cervix, using a Hagar's dilator and then we do the curatage. So this is the correct uh, sequence. Assess the size and direction, sound the uterus, do a dilatation and then do a curatage. Okay, and those for those of you who are interested, if you go back, most of my videos 
would have answers of almost all the questions uh, my videos on insta and on youtube um, the longer videos are on youtube and i have uh, described the procedure in an, and there's a video of an actual dnc being done in the patient uh, so you can have a look here the same steps have been explained and shown also in a video so i always feel that you remember better if you've actually seen something so if you see the procedure if you if you've seen it uh, i you obviously can't bring you to the ot with me so i try to bring the ot to all of you so if you see my videos there's a lot of practical clinical uh, work which i do procedures which i do deliveries vacuum cesarean dnc hysterectomy so you can go and see and once you see you remember better that is what i feel okay next question which is false about the placenta okay so um, again simple question directly picked up from williams and all the books give this actually so weight is about 4 and 500 grams yes the thickness is 2.5 cm yes diameter also some people were saying was an option it is 22 cm yes uh, oval in shape yes and what was the wrong statement it was the umbilical cord does not have two vessels we all know this it has three vessels an umbilical vein and two umbilical arteries so this is um, again a very simple previous year question uh, placenta is very very commonly asked in the evening paper also there was a question on the placenta so this is the normal placenta 470 gram round to oval central thickness is 2.5 centimeters it is composed of a placental disc extra placental membranes and a three vessel cord it has two plates the basal plate which is actually the maternal side which has cotyledons attached to the deciduous of the uterus and the chorionic plate which is the fetal side where the umbilical cord inserts so this is the chorionic plate and the one uh, uh, inside is the basal plate okay so again, this is a previous year question. So actually, gynae, if you see, was a lot of previous year, a lot of uh, common topics which have been asked. And if for those of you who have thorough with your previous years, it should have been a relatively simple paper. So which is not a method of LARC. What is LARC? LARC is long acting reversible contraception. Okay, so what, what what would be the option then? It would be tubectomy because tubectomy is irreversible. For all practical purposes, it is irreversible. So what are the different types of LARC? LARC basically means where the frequency of administrating that contraceptive is more than a month. And in that comes your injectable contraceptives, intrauterine devices and implants whose frequency is you're not giving it daily or weekly, you're giving it monthly or beyond so that is the definition of a long acting reversible contraception and i think the last question of the morning session were what are the branch the last inict or i think inict last year the question was anterior division which is not a division which is not a branch of the uh, anterior division this time the question asked was branches of the posterior division why is this important for us because we this is the main artery supplying the pelvis it could be an anatomy question you can take it as a gynae question however but very very important branches of the internal iliac anterior branches and posterior branches i think this was a multiple choice question if i'm not mistaken but these are the branches of the posterior division ileolumbar lateral sacral superior luteal this is the ileolumbar this is the lateral sacral this is the superior luteal there are lots of mnemonics available these are the anterior divisions these are the posterior divisions um, and one of the easiest ways to remember is i i think you all know this okay i love sex okay so that's one of the um, uh, easy mnemonics to remember i'm sure most of you know this and the anterior division also has mnemonics you can go back and read okay i won't waste time on this again previous year question so if 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 you've been asked anterior division last year and you ask posterior division here i would say this is a previous year repeat question because when you read a previous year question try to read everything about it don't just limit think that a direct repeat will come this is how they change the question slightly and ask it okay now coming to the evening session so 15 questions in the morning and i think we had i'm not not mistaken 17 or 18 questions in the evening session altogether of course there may be more i might have missed some questions this is what i have got uh, from my students uh, who have got back to me uh, with the recalls and I've tried to compile them. I may have missed out on some some things, but I have tried to be as complete as possible since yesterday I've been working on this. And uh, thank you to all my students who helped me uh, uh, compile this uh, recall. Okay, next question. 
this was one of the only clinical question that was there. 35 weaker primary gravida presents with a BP of 170, 110, which is quite high. She complains of abdominal pain and blurred <coughs> vision. The uterus is contracting. Fetal heart is 140 beats per minute. On vaginal examination, she is 2 cm dilated and 50% effaced. What is the best management option? Okay, so you have a scenario of basically severe preeclampsia with impending eclampsia. And whenever there is severe preeclampsia, remember after 34 weeks, we terminate the pregnancy. We deliver her. There is no point waiting beyond 34 weeks. On top of that, she has impending eclampsia. So what will we do? We will have to give her profile access with magnesium sulfate and lo and behold, she is already in labor. So we don't have to actually do anything. We just allow labor to progress or augment labor. Right, that's the best scenario you can have. Severe preeclampsia coming herself in labor and she's more than 34 weeks. So don't do anything. I mean, don't stop labor so you won't give tocolysis. There's no indication as of now to do an LSS. I don't even know if this was an option, but I know this was an option and this is the correct option. Okay, you won't deliver at 37 weeks. She's more than 34. Severe preeclampsia, deliver now. So remember in obstetrics, I always talk about two things. When will you deliver a patient? And how will you deliver a patient? So these are the two things which are asked commonly when it comes to a clinical scenario. And that's all you need to know. Okay. So there's a very blurry image of NST. Please somebody, if you could please tell me what this was. Because I've asked many, many students and nobody said, they all said the images. This is one problem with the INICT. Apparently all the images were very bad quality. Even on zooming in, nobody could make out um, uh, a lot of images. This is one of this is one of the blurry images. Okay, so there was an image of an NST, um, and it was asked, "What is the correct option?" Okay, so they are all saying it was an NST. Sorry, NST and not a CTG. What is the difference between the two? A NST is a non-stress test. Remember, this is a part of antepartum fetal monitoring. Okay, and a CTG is a cardiotopogram. This is a part of intrapartum fetal monitoring. What's the difference? In an NST, you won't have the lower line which measures the uterine contractions because she is not in labor. You just have the fetal heart rate tracing. Okay, that is the top line. Whereas in CTG, which is an intrapartum, intrapartum means during labor, you have two lines. You have a graph of the fetal heart rate and you have a corresponding heart of the uterine contractions. Okay, so this is cardio and this is toco. Okay, so now apart from this, uh, most students told me there was an option of this is an NST, this is a CTG and most of you marked that this is an NST because there was only one line on top. The other two options were not making much sense to me, something about variability. Okay, but um, uh, so if you could get me a better idea of what this question was, I'd be very grateful. Please write down in the comments and I will get back to you. Okay. So there was a sequence question, a range in the correct sequence of performing active management of third stage of labor. So AM, TSL, again a previous year repeat, although this, this order has never been asked, but it's very, very, very important. In fact, we I have taken several lectures for nursing students, for MBBS students in the skills lab of what or how to do AMTSL. Very important from exam point of view. Okay, so what, what, what do you do first? Number one, you first check if any baby is present or not because if it's a multiple pregnancy which has been missed at the bottom, you will be uh, obstructing the other baby from coming out. The uterus will contract over the second baby. So exclude multiple pregnancy. Then give your 10 units I am oxytocin or the other oxytocics as advised by the WHO. Okay, but the standard is 10 units intramuscular oxytocin. Then what do you do? Then you have to remove the placenta by doing a controlled cord traction. And then you have to check if the uterus is contracted by doing a uterine massage. Feeling for the uterus, if it is not contracted, massage the uterus. So this is the order. Check the baby. If there's another baby, give oxytocin, controlled cord traction and then massage the uterus. Um, very early on, when I started my classes, I had... In the skills lab, I had taken a video and you can find this on Instagram. Uh, uh, it's a short, less than a minute reel of active management of third stage of labor. Okay, please check this out. Unfortunately, I'm unable to play this. Um, somehow the media, some uh, 
compatibility issues. So please check this out on Insta. Okay, another sequence arrange the um, following on mechanism. So mechanism of labor steps were asked and the correct order was asked. So what's the correct order? So remember engagement is first. After engagement comes flexion that was not there. Then internal rotation that was not there. Then crowning and extension. The head is worn by first crown. The fetus crowns and then extends. Then restitution happens. Then external rotation. So engagement. Okay. Crowning. Restitution and external rotation. Again, you can find this in my YouTube videos. Okay, again, a very important topic uh, on Insta and YouTube. Both you can find this. Okay, so this is these are the steps of mechanism of labor. Extension happens. So just prior to extension happens crowning. Okay, and then extension happens. This is a mnemonic I like teaching. Every darn fool in Egypt royally eats raw eggs okay so engagement descent flexion internal rotation extension and just before this crowning okay restitution external rotation and then expulsion of the remaining fetus okay so lots of mnemonics you all find your own way to learn but the best way to learn is actually take a fetus and a pelvis with you especially those who have access to it and practice especially those who are still doing their MBPS and have to give your university exams it is asked to every student so you should know this okay again a lot of confusion on the image okay I took out a few images nobody is able to they all say it was very blurry no one was sure but most are saying that definitely there was a accentuate lobe and a few are saying that it was also a velamentous or a membranous insertion that is the cord is inserting into the membrane this is not the exact image this is just put here for uh, sake of completion but again, those of you uh, who remember, please get back to me and tell me what it was. Again, placenta is a very important but repeatedly asked question. So it's one area you can't afford to miss. Next question. And this has been asked. So Anemia Mukharat has been asked earlier. The question asked was different. But the topic uh, is the same and that emphasizes the need that you should know everything about anemia mukhaharat. So what is the treatment for a 34 weeks primary with mild to moderate anemia? Okay, so is it, is it injection? F? Again, the options, I'm not sure. I asked a few students, um, I could not complete the option. So let me know what it was. But um, I would say this would be the correct option, injection ferry, carboxymaltose, if not tolerating oral iron. The other options would give two tablets iron plus iron sucrose or three tablets oral iron. So what does Anemia Mukbharat say? Anemia Mukbharat says that there is a, it was introduced in 2018, it is a 6 by 6 by 6 strategy. Six population groups are covered, six interventions are there and six institutional mechanisms are in place. Okay, what are the six interventions? The six interventions are prophylactic iron and folic acid, deworming, intensified behavioral change communication campaign, testing and treating of anemia, which is what we will focus on for this question, mandatory provision of iron and folic acid fortified foods, and addressing non-nutritional causes of anemia, especially emphasis on malaria and hemoglobinopathies. Okay, now for pregnant women, the population which concerns us in this question is the pregnant woman. And for mild and moderate anemia, that is 10 to 10.9 and 7 to 9.9, .9, what do you do? So the first line of treatment at all levels of care says that you give iron and folic acid. Normally for prophylaxis, we give one tablet. It says give two tablets daily. Okay, but if the woman is... In if the anemia is detected later in pregnancy, so if the anemia is late in pregnancy, or if you think she is going to be non-compliant, so tall, so the non-compliance is likely to be high, so high chance of or high chance of loss to follow up. You can also give as first line treatment injection ferry carboxymaltose or iron sucrose. Okay, so either give oral iron BD. Or you give injection iron sucrose or FCM. Don't give both. Okay. And if she is near to delivery or late in pregnancy or less likely to follow up or unlikely to take the tablet, then of course parental iron is a better option. Same for moderate anemia. So for moderate is the same thing. Either give iron BD or give parental iron by sucrose or FCM if she is again less likely to uh, comply or if she is late in pregnancy. 
then the same thing. So for mild and moderate, it's the same. Treatment is the same. For severe anemia, if she's late in pregnancy, you need to hospitalize her. Okay. And preferably parenteral iron treatment is required if she is far from delivery. So this is anemia mukbath. It's available. Uh, the entire intervention is available online. Just search on Google anemia mukbath and you'll get everything. Okay, and it's uh, very straightforward. Uh, it's important from your PSM point of view and from OBS and gynae. Okay, another easy question. Again, a previous year repeat topic. OC pills is always asked. They either ask a missed pill or a side effect or now they've asked non-contraceptive benefit which is not a non-contraceptive benefit and the answer is it doesn't prevent against STDs or HIV but yes it reduces the risk of endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer and ectopic pregnancy. So remember the cancers it reduces, OC pills will provide protection against colorex. So remember this as CEO, right? colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, but it increases the incidence of breast cancer and to some extent it also increases the incidence of uh, uh, cervical cancer. This is not really proven, but some studies say yes, it does. Okay. What are the other benefits? Reduce blood loss, regularizes the cycle, reduces the instance of PID, decreases pregnancies in general, of course, because it's a contraceptive and also ectopic pregnancy, endometriosis and fibroids, it reduces, improves bone density, reduces benign breast diseases, okay, and the gross perinone, the newer fourth generation have anti mineralocorticoid action, so they improve acne and <coughs> hirsutism. Okay, next question. Protein hormones secreted from the placenta help me complete the list. These two are steroid hormones. <coughs> HCG is a glycoprotein. So these are the, this is, it is a protein hormone. And this is again a table from Williams. This is a very important table. A question always comes from here. These are the peptide hormones secreted by the placenta. The ones primarily secreted and the secondary ones also. Everything is given about them. This table is very important. So I'm putting all the important tables from Williams. You can see direct questions come directly picked up from the tables. Okay. Hormone not involved in the growth of the fetus. Okay. And this is a little question which I'm told it has been asked previously. And the answer is growth hormone. Okay. So Williams, this line is from Williams. And what does Williams say? That fetal growth still progresses so the role of growth hormone it says is unknown in the fetus and fetal growth will still progress in the complete absence of this hormone okay so this is picked up from the chapter on maternal physiology in williams okay and the role of growth hormone in fetal growth is remains unknown in women who have complete absence of growth hormone also the fetus grows well so this is why this is the answer okay so a primary amenorrhea scenario and one that was very simple actually because lots of clues were given okay so you have a young girl with amenorrhea she is short statured with a webbed neck ultrasound shows a hypoplastic uterus with streak gonads FSH and LH are increased. What is your diagnosis? Okay, so this gives us a lot of clues. You have a web neck, short statured. Okay, and this itself tells you that you're pointing towards Turner syndrome. What are the other clues? You have a small uterus. Okay, and you have streak gonads. Again, a clue here. Okay, if you have streak gonads, the estrogen levels will be low and that will cause a positive feedback and FSH LH will be high. So this is a cause, this is what is causing the amenorrhea. So this is Turner syndrome. Okay, Kalman syndrome will be hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. So FSH LH levels will be low. In MRKH, this is a, 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 a problem. The uterus is not there. So you have estrogen levels normal. You have FSH LH levels normal. So you have eugonadotrophic eugonadism. And AIS, of course, is completely is a completely separate thing. So you have compartment 1 defects, compartment 2 B defects, compartment 3 defects and compartment 4 defects. I won't go into too much detail because I have an entire lecture on YouTube. You can go and check it out and you'll understand better. Okay, so this is a new topic asked. This was new completely 
and it asked about perimortem cesarean section. So critical care in obstetrics is an upcoming branch. It's an important thing. So uh, you should know a bit about it. So what is a perimortem cesarean? It is done to improve the uh, outcome of a woman because a pregnant uterus, if the uterus is more than 24 weeks, it affects the quality of CPR. So if the woman does not get resuscitated within four minutes, okay, the guidelines are to do a perimortem cesarean section. Okay, and a perimortem cesarean section means do it as quickly as possible. Wherever you are, do it immediately. And it is done in the form of a classical. So a vertical incision on the skin and also a vertical incision on the uterus is the technique of doing it. Without anesthesia, wherever you are, it has to be done. This helps improve maternal uh, outcome of CPR. So if this maternal collapse and CPR, the woman is not resuscitated in four minutes, then you have to do a perimortem cesarean section. It is done anywhere. It doesn't. So you don't have to take an informed consent because you're saving the life of the mother. Sterility is not a concern. You don't have to catheterize it. There's just no time. You have to do it as soon as possible. It's a very difficult decision to take. But yes, many times it has to be done. Again, a previous year question. This has come several years back. Okay. And I think it was asked, Ulta, as in what is vaginus uteri, vaginus uterinus, but, um, and what is it? It is crying of the fetus. So Something was told me it was asked in the opposite way of how I've asked it. But this is more or less what the question was. Easy question, previous year. Okay. Next question. All can cause non-immune high drops except... So what cannot cause non-immune high drops? So HS, so remember non-immune high drops can be caused by most viral infections except HIV. Okay, HIV cannot cause or does not cause non-immune high drops. But all these infections, again, this table is from Williams, causes of non-immune high drops from Williams. Okay, and in this, I've just enlarged the infections uh, part. So, parvovirus, syphilis, CMV, toxo, rubella, entero, varicella, HSV, coxsackie, listeriosis, these are the bacterial infections causing it. So, all, but HIV is not there. You must have had HIV in pregnancy also, you've never encountered uh, it causing high drops. It's a very, it's a question that we really ruled out based on exclusion, even if you don't know the answer. So, relatively simple question. There were two questions on abruption and placenta previa. Okay, and I do not know the entire questions. Um, if you do know, please let me know in the comments section. Okay, so remember not seen an abruption. I think the answer here, because one of the other options is a warning hemorrhage. Warning hemorrhage is typically seen in placenta previa. Okay, so basic difference is placenta previa is when the placenta is low-lying. Abruption is separation of a normally implanted placenta. So placenta in the upper segment separates. It is cause, causes abruption. Placenta previa is a low elbow lying placenta which bleeds because of its position. Okay. Now, this is very important to remember. This is painless. Okay. And this is painful, especially if it is concealed abruption. Okay. Placenta previa, remember, typically is recurrent. That's why there will be a warning hemorrhage. She'll have bleeding a few episodes, then come with a sudden bout of severe bleeding. Okay. This is not recurrent. Okay. Abruption. If the placenta separates, you have to deliver the woman. There's no role of conservative management because if the placenta has separated, the fetus will die. The mother will get sick. Okay. Uh, so you have to deliver the patient. Placenta previa, however, however, there is a role of conservative management and we try to take the patient to 37 weeks and then we deliver her most of the time by a cesarean section okay so this is not life threatening but unless it is severe bleeding but this is definitely life threatening so remember painless painful remember recurrent and this is not recurrent if it happens you have to deliver the woman okay Okay, so there was a question on cisplatin resistance. Again, I'm not sure what the options were. And this is a question which was a little difficult, I think, for some students. It is not a usual question asked. Okay, so which is correct? So what is cisplatin resistance? We need to remember that. Okay, so where is cisplatin given? It is given in the treatment of ovarian malignancies. Okay, so after doing a de um, a debulking surgery, <coughs> we do, we give the woman um, uh, that, um, 
cisplatin or carboplatin along with battery taxes. Now, what is platinum sensitivity and platinum resistance we need to know? So, when we talk about, so we give the woman chemotherapy. If she progresses despite the chemotherapy, that means you're giving chemotherapy and she's still progressing, that is called as platinum refractoriness. So, she's refractory to your treatment. Suppose you've completed the treatment, she's been fine, but within six months of completion of treatment, she has a recurrence that it is called as platinum resistance. Okay, if she's fine for six months after completion of treatment and then has a recurrence, she's called as platinum sensitive. That means she's responded, but she's had a recurrence after six months. We can divide this into the first six months. That means after six months, it is called as partial sensitivity, but if it is after a year, it is called as complete sensitivity, okay? So, anything after six months is platinum sensitive. Before six months is platinum resistance. Remember, six months as the cutoff, you have platinum resistance, platinum sensitivity, and you have partial sensitivity if it is less than a year. After a year, you have complete sensitivity. Now, going back to the question. Okay, so the question, um, again, I'm not sure of the options. So, resistance is recurrence within 6 months, which is true. Partial sensitivity is recurrence within 6 to 12 months, which is also true. And sensitivity is recurrence after 12 months, which is also true. So, I think all of the above would be the correct option. But again, please check the answers, the options. I am not sure what the options were. Okay, if these were the options, the answer would be all of the above. Okay, I think this was the last question we had. There was an image on a fetal procedure. So, there was... Uh, th this is not the exact image, of course, okay, but uh, what I got to know, it was an, an image showing amniocentesis and then if that was the image, this would be the correct option because an amniocentesis is usually done between 15 to 20 weeks. It can be done any time, but for diagnostic purposes, it is done between 15 to 20 weeks. A chorionic villus sampling is done between 10 to 13 weeks. This is not a fetal doctor and I don't know the fourth option. Again, the image was not very clear. So, those who know about this image or who have a better idea, please let me know. Okay, one more question. As I was saying in the first paper, vulval cancer came. The age here, risk factor came, which is not a risk factor. Smoking is a risk factor. HPV is a risk factor. Vulval dystrophy is a risk factor. Hamartuma is not. This is a benign vascular lesion on the vulva and it is not a risk factor for vulval cancer. So, this is just, up. so that was the second paper. You can see it was a very easy, um, a sort of relaxed. I felt OBG was quite relaxed actually. You didn't have to think too much in any of the questions except for those blurry images. It was more or less straightforward. Most of the students I spoke to felt OBG was all right on the easier side. But of course, everyone's opinion differs. <clears throat> the last INICT, I had to do a lot of research, opening Williams for everything. This was, except for one or two questions, it was pretty much, uh, you knew the answer. Okay, so 80% were previous year questions, 80% and that's a huge number, not direct questions, but yes, topics. So, please read these topics. They are high yield areas. New questions, I wouldn't say vulval C is not very new. It is. Uh, it has been asked a few years earlier in AIMS, treatment was asked, a lesion was given, how will you treat was asked. So, yes, the area has been asked before, but a less likely to be asked area. Uterine dysfunction was new, platinum resistance was relatively new, uh, amniocentesis, the image was new, and perimortem cesarean was new. So, you can see very less new questions out of 30 to 33 questions, uh, five questions were from new areas. Okay, of course, less clinical scenarios and less images in OBG, which was a bit surprising. I would have been happier if there were more clinical scenarios because they're fun to answer. But yes, given the lengthiness of the paper, I'm, I, I guess it's, it's good the questions were less uh, clinical. So, remember, um, uh, don't think that you're far from the top. Just look behind and see how far you've come. So, that's what I do um, in my journey. You, you, you think you, you get there's times when I also get very frustrated. And I understand the same for you. You have so much life ahead of you. And just look back from first year MBBS till now, second year MBBS till now. See how far you've come. See your journey. So, look at it that way. And always retain that optimism. So, thank you very much. Uh, please add on the comments. This was not a very uh, accurate recall. 
but um, i am very thankful to my students who helped me compile all this together um, uh, so thank you very much please given in your inputs and uh, thank you good night